Good morning, Los Angeles, and welcome to the last day of the virtual fact-finding mission LA 2028 on sports and infrastructure. It's 8 o'clock uh, in the morning here in California, and we're happy to have you here again. If you want to post about this mission on social media, please do use the hashtag Digitale Missie, hashtag NLUSA, and tag us, the Consulate General, at NLINSF. If you have any questions uh, for uh, our speakers or uh, panelists today, please leave them in the chat box below your viewer. Um, and of course, that is for the participants who are watching this uh, virtual fact-finding mission through a special viewer on, their, on the online platform. Gerbert, good morning. This is the last day. Good morning, how, do you, Sietze. how do you feel? Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased, actually. It's a very inspiring week. Uh, it's just great to see how you can, even online, forge new connections, forge new contacts, and really uh, set next steps. It was all a, a fact-finding mission, so it's a bit different than other digital missions. Uh, so we have still eight years ahead of us. But I feel like we really have a, made a great progress this week, and I want to thank all the participants and of course the partners for making this possible. And um, I feel like we will be able to come to a good report in October and we'll take it from there. Um, a bit back to the Olympic Games. Um, every Olympics has some historic moments that will that change sports uh, forever. Uh, what, is a, what is a historic moment that, that stayed with you for uh, forever? Yeah, well, I must say it's I think more personal in a way, because um, I remember uh, Munich Olympic Games 1976, and we had uh, a famous Dutch swimmer, Enid Brigitta from Curaçao, and she won two bronze medals. And that was for me, I was a bit younger then. Uh, I was around Sietze, I mean, just to say that. Uh, it was very special uh, to have a uh, sort of a Dutch swimmer from Curaçao to win medals, and as well because my wife was in the same period living in Curaçao. Uh, I mean, that was uh, what I realized later, of course. Uh, now, LA 2028 one is promising to become historic games as well. Um, uh, for one, because they want to be the most sustainable games ever, but the, the sports achievements we have to wait, of course. Um, but 2028 is far away. So what's next for this mission? How can we turn this mission into, uh, yeah, into a real-life collaboration between the US uh, and the Netherlands? Yeah, I think that's, of course, now uh, the next uh, step. The question I just said, like, we will have a report in October. Uh, this will sketch a bit, the, I would say, the road uh, to Los Angeles 2028. Um, I would say we have great opportunities in the field of smart and e-mobility. We can sort of build on the mission of last June. Uh, wonderful opportunities in the field of circular economy, circular events, and uh, smart uh, stadiums. I think we've showcased uh, the Arena Stadium uh, quite a lot, but we introduced as well many of the other participants' uh, backgrounds. And I think we have really uh, good leads for next steps. And, uh, well, we shared with you that we have the Netherlands Business Support Office in Los Angeles available. And, of course, the great help of the team in the embassy and uh, the people back home in the ministries to uh, be really a team NL. I think this was the approach of uh, Maurits Hendricks on the first day. Uh, to be a team NL means that we will really join forces with sports associations, the athletes and business. And we would love to facilitate that out of San Francisco for this wonderful Olympic Games in 2028. Yeah, Gerbert, you mentioned uh, some of the aspects of this, uh, this virtual fact-finding mission. Um, during this week, Dutch companies and organizations uh, connected to LA starting the road to LA 2028. Let's take a look at the previous days in this after movie. Welcome to this first day of the virtual fact-finding mission LA 2028 on sports and infrastructure. Olympic Summer Games and Paralympics are coming back to Los Angeles in 2028 for the third time. The mayor said that each time LA has hosted the Games, we've been a Games uh, changer. And we have the potential, I think, to do that again in 2028. I think this concept of reusing what's there, but then of course renovating and bringing it up to the state of art, I think that's the interesting part for the Netherlands, because we can be helpful there. We have innovations, we have all kinds of test beds. 
So there are going to be a lot of opportunities for international companies and Dutch companies to come over here and secure those contracts to provide those different types of technological uh, advancement that we'll need. I think it's good for us to know where you guys see uh, the big challenges coming up, because that is perhaps uh, also uh, areas where, where Dutch uh, companies can connect making these games into the most sustainable games ever. I know that is your plan. But when we talk about reuse, our model is we are going to rent facilities in Los Angeles. I want to make sure that the Dutch companies know that there's a vast uh, supportive network uh, that's waiting for them to be here, and we're looking forward to supporting and helping them enter this market. Our cultures, our business cultures uh, go well uh, together is the vision that we just described to bring the world to L.A. and L.A. to the world. We have people from all over the world come over here because it's such a driven culture to achieve what you have to set out to do. That was, I think, quite an impressive overview of the last days. But there is still one day what we really want to make a success of. And um, I think I would now maybe to uh, mention Claudia Bakker. And, you know, diversity inclusion is an important topic uh, here in California and as well as in Los Angeles. Claudia, good morning. You're an entrepreneur in Los Angeles focusing on female entrepreneurship. And we met last year because you were one of the nominees for the Holland in the Valley Award. Um, so... How are you in, I mean, given the circumstances of COVID, of course, in Los Angeles? I think, um, hi, good morning, by the way. <laughs> um, well, personally, yeah, very good. Um, business, of course, yeah, it's, we're all hurting, I think, um, especially because I'm dealing with a lot of independent um, business owners. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, I think people are very in, uh, inventive and they come up with these solutions. Um, and I definitely think that inclusion is super important to uh, for any business. So you did start Oya. Could you tell us a bit more why you started it and uh, what the aim of your company is? Yes, I worked for 20 years or over 20 years in a, in a male-dominated environment. Um, and I thought it was time for us women to connect and, and ask uh, each other questions, important questions like uh, who's your accountant or um, how do you sell stock or securities or, you know, more on a business level. Uh, that's why I started oh, yeah, the first mobile app for women owned businesses. And how important, you mentioned, of course, uh, the inclusion and diversity aspect. How important is it in, in daily business life in Los Angeles? Oh, I, yeah, it's, it's super important. I mean, the, the I mean, men are wonderful. <laughs> Don't get me Thanks. wrong. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think that um, between men, it's like a part of friendship and, and culture to discuss business. Um, and with us women, not always. So um, in, especially, I think, in Los Angeles, um, we, have, we have a really, I think, cool major, mayor. Um, and you feel that, you know, racism is different than in Europe. Um, it has a different history. Um, I think especially black female entrepreneurs have um, a hard time outside, you know, in America. So I think they need to be supported. Uh, but I think Los Angeles is compared to other states. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. It's probably not political correct, but I think we're further more advanced than other states. And do you have a, maybe an advice? How can Dutch businesses coming to LA take this into consideration, this aspect of diversity, inclusivity? Maybe you have some examples of some sort of successful entrepreneurs who uh, made sort of uh, uh, great business plans. I would say um, stay away from greenwashing, um, meaning do not hire somebody just because the color of their skin or, or background, but truly want this change. Truly say like, okay, uh, I have so many men in my organization. Where do women contribute to the success of our company or business? I think if you truly 
um, investigate uh, uh, your company structure and look where you would, you know, have plays. I think honesty and 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 you will be successful if that will, you know, be in the core of any business. And in America, I don't even think you can start a business. Um, sorry, when it's all male and all white, I think it's very hard at the moment. Well, thank you so much for your insights. And uh, I was really pleased to talk to you, Claudia. I wish you all the best with Oya and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon again. Um, so it has been mentioned before, uh, these Olympic Games in 2028, they will be the most sustainable games ever. Uh, Adam Duvendek, Vice President of Operations at LA Galaxy Stadium. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Adam, Dignity Health Sports Park is well known for its sustainable approaches. Uh, could you share some of these uh, with us, some of these projects? Absolutely. You know, we are owned and operated by AEG along with the, the Galaxy. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of our sustainability projects uh, progress or the sustainability uh, efforts that we've been making are largely guided by our larger uh, corporate program, AEG One Earth. Uh, we have corporate sustainability, uh, you know, opportunities that we're looking at throughout the, the, the company as a whole, focusing on, uh, you know, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, reducing potable water consumption, and also uh, diverting waste from landfill. And those are you know, some of the key metrics that we focus on from a facility perspective. Uh, as a venue, specifically speaking to Dignity Health Sports Park, we've been a leader for many years in the way that we approach sustainability. We were actually the first uh, stadium in the United States, outdoor stadium, to become ISO 14001 certified. Uh, and, you know, while a number of those processes that we implemented in that certification have informed our generally our general operations uh you know a lot of that is lost on on our guests and so the new approach that we've been making over the course of the last several years has been focusing on uh telling stories that resonate with our fans and, and changing our stadium in visual ways that allow our fans to interact and and uh, understand some of the our, the larger areas. Uh, examples of that would be we have an employee garden. Uh, it's it's about an acre in size that allows our uh, employees to come in. People that uh, may live in an apartment complex and not have the ability to uh, have a garden at home to come in and, and utilize that. Uh, it's called the Galaxy Garden. We've built an 800 square foot greenhouse. We've also taken other areas of the facility with ornamental foliage uh, and replace those with uh, avocado orchards and citrus orchards. And uh, that has really paved the way towards our next piece that we use the galaxy, kind of our spokes piece for these sustainability initiatives called Protect the Pitch. Protect the Pitch is a program um, that utilizes uh, the galaxy and the stadium initiatives to tell a story around sustainability. Um, and one of the programs under, uh, under Protect the Pitch has been uh, a youth program where we bring kids into our garden, let them understand where food comes from. We have hundreds of kids from local surrounding schools. A lot of them have never seen a farm and don't understand where food comes from, uh, but it gives them their opportunity to come in, uh, see how uh, food is made. And uh, it's really been, uh, you know, a, a unique uh, way of telling a story around sustainability. And that really allows us to have the larger conversation about some of the other projects which don't necessarily resonate so easily with fans about energy storage, solar, uh, you know, waste aversion, that type of thing. Yeah, well, that's a really great story. And I think it will be quite hard to find another uh, stadium that really provides a garden to its employees. Uh, and tell the st story of farm to fork to uh, to children. So, uh, well, I really sort of uh, want to commend you uh, there. That's, that's a great thing. And the stadium is an important uh, facility during the Olympic Games in 2028. I think you will host a number of sports. Uh, how do you prepare for that? Uh, yeah, so for the Olympics, we will be dubbed the uh, South Bay Sports Park. Uh, we also will be uh, have been given the, the designation as the Green Sports Park. We've been chosen because of the advances that we've made to date 
but also the things that we're looking for uh, in the future. From the moment the bid came through for initially LA24 and then 28, uh, we were in discussions with uh, LA28 and, and you know Casey's group on ways that we could continue to uh, drive our initiatives in sustainability. We've had conversations about everything from solar to uh, energy storage. We currently have a two megawatt battery uh, on site that we use, but we can expand on that. We can make that larger. And I think these are all things uh, that we're exploring as the Olympics come in 2028. Wonderful. Uh, we, use, we use reclaimed water on a regular basis, but we can polish that water on site and make it more usable so that we don't have to use so many chemicals to counteract some of the negative uh, elements of using reclaimed water. Um, there's a number of things that we're looking at and really the sky's the limit. Um, we're focusing on innovation as we move into the games. Wonderful. I, I was just like last question for you. Um, I, Adam, I was thinking you are a former Olympic cyclist and you've competed in the Olympics in Athens and Beijing. How do you bring this experience into your daily life? Just as a personal question. Sure. I mean, I think as I apply to work and in, in anything, you know, part of being an Olympian is, is that strive for excellence. And I think that, you know, regardless of whether that pertains to sport or pertains to uh, your, you know, the way that you carry yourself on a, on a daily, um, you know, from a work perspective is, is really applying that, that, that sense of excellence to everything that you do. And I think, you know, from a management side is that, you know, leading a group of people that we're all trying to support the galaxy and, in uh, in any way that we can so that they can find excellence on the field. Uh, you know, we try and instill that in our employees and, and really focus and just have a, a higher level of, uh, of uh, excellence in everything that we perform here at the stadium. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam. It was great talking to you to learn more about your uh, sort of very interesting project. Uh, all the best uh, in your preparations towards the Games. I'd like now to move on to uh, Gijs de Jong. He's the Secretary General of the Royal Dutch Football Association, uh, with 1.2 million members, the biggest sports association in the Netherlands. Um, Gijs, what has been the biggest eye-opener for you during this uh, sports mission? Well, well, good morning and for you. And uh, let's first go back. It's Royal Netherlands Football Association. I'm That's sorry. Minor, minor detail, minor detail. An important minor detail. detail. Yes, uh, I, th I think the, um, uh, the biggest eye-opener so far for us is that this mission really gives us a, f a great um, a first impression of the American sports culture. And of course, there are a lot of uh, differences between um, uh, LA and the Netherlands, but also a lot of similarities. And I think what is similar uh, between us and LA is, is the will to improve and the will to innovate. And what is maybe different is maybe the infrastructure a little bit and, and, um, and the organization of sports, but uh, it's good to see and, and really get a good, good, good picture. And we're talking a lot, of course, about uh, 2028, but for us also 2026 is an important year when, uh, when the World Cup will go to, to Canada, Mexico and, and USA. So that's why USA is also very important uh, to us. So uh, now I think it's, it's for us, it's um, great to get, get a first picture uh, in the exploration of, uh, of USA. Well, thanks. And We've discussed all kinds of sports and innovations uh, and many sustainability projects. Would you say that soccer uh, is also a leader on, in these topics? And do you have, perhaps have an example? Well, I, I think we, we launched our, um, our international strategy for the future of our football in 2018. And before starting to write our, um, our, um, our strategy, we asked ourselves the question is, who are we? And maybe even more important, who do we want to be as, as Netherlands football? And, uh, and the answer was based on our DNA. It's based on things like innovation, being open-minded, transparent, daring, passionate, connecting, and sometimes a little bit stubborn. And I think what makes uh, the Netherlands good sometimes is that we dare to go left where everybody goes right. And, and that, that's sometimes impossible to work with in an organization, but... Uh, it sometimes works, and I think what shows our um, our other way of thinking is the way our national team plays, 
is uh, the investment we made in in uh, in the women's game and unfortunately we lost against USA in the, in the final in France uh, last year but we really improved on that we did a lot on on the R&D and the research and development on the VAR uh, together with the people of the of the MLS and um, and uh, and maybe totally different example is uh, it was our president stepping up against Seb Blatter for the first time in 2014 around uh, the, the FIFA Congress in, uh, in Sao Paulo. So, uh, so I would say, yes, we can contribute. Uh, we like to work on innovation. We like to work on sustainability. And that's, that's one of the key pillars of our strategy for the coming years. Well, thank you so much, guys. We'll be back uh, just in a few minutes. Uh, to talk about reimagined football uh, together with Dennis de Kluze, because I would like now to introduce Dennis de Kluze, the general manager of LA Galaxy. And thank you very much, Dennis, for dining in while training in Orlando, Florida. Uh, MLS is uh, sort of starting up with a tournament. How is the return to sports during COVID-19? Hello, how are you? It's, uh, it's still early here, so good morning and even more good morning there. Um, I think it's, it's quite an experience. I've, I've compared it a little bit like walking into a dark room and, and not knowing what to expect after the pandemic and the, and the crisis that, that uh, obviously everybody has been affected with. Um, the MLS and all its clubs have, have been very proactive in trying to get a return to play schedule and an idea on how to put the product of, of soccer, as they call it here in the United States, on TV and, and maybe to a bigger fan base. Um, now, with everything that goes on in the United States on, on well, first of all, obviously, uh, COVID issues, but also the divisiveness in, in that we've seen in the last few months, uh, the political level of, of, of decisions, it's been quite a challenge to, uh, to unite and to, to come to a complete conclusion. I must say that I've I've been here for a year and a half. I've worked on the other side of the ocean from Holland uh, a long time. I've worked a long time in Mexico. I ran the Mexican national team for years. And, and this experience has been an eye opener because it's uh, a sport that's, that's differently approached. I must say that there is a positiveness on, on growing it, uh, on innovation, on everything to be able to, to go to a more higher priority within the society in the United States. Uh, as this sport and one of the ideas was basically uh, with still the coronavirus roaring through the United States create a bubble or a, or a, set, a setting that allows 26 teams to, to stay together to have the ability to train the ability to basically uh, start a league or start uh, regular games. Um, now, this has been very challenging, as you know, that, that and I think in, in every uh, country of the world, you've seen players that have been training at home and they have been on lockdown and they haven't been able to leave. We've had a couple of weeks of, of preparation before coming here, but it's still a challenging, uh, a challenging thing. It's uh, COVID tests every other day. Uh, basically, you sit on a room for a couple of weeks waiting for the games. The games are pretty challenging. The level of MLS, now a league that's been around for 25 years, has, has grown a lot. Um, sometimes uh, you see in the news that it's, it's obviously considered as a league for, for players that are in the back end of their career, but I think that gets less and less. You see players that are younger and choose it as a destination league and from here would like to go and move somewhere else but there's a whole bunch of challenges obviously ahead and and seeing where the country goes as a whole to be able to even implement a, a formal uh, league schedule for the rest of the year yeah thank you and you already touched upon the different approach here in the u.s compared to the netherlands uh what would you maybe give an example uh what would be a big difference in in your opinion uh, between the netherlands and, and the u.s uh, in in sort of the sport landscape well, I, I, if I would refer to soccer, or, or at least my my own uh, uh, little world, I think the difference in how people approach soccer is is completely different. It's been seen in a lot of a lot of time, uh, in a lot of cases, as as an event, and not so much as a sport where it's 
it's a tradition that carries from family members to family members and from generation to generation. It's a relatively new sport. It's been set up here uh, with uh, obviously examples of other American sports which make it sometimes challenging with salary caps, with trades, with drafts. Obviously, the, the difference in, in what it is in the United States and, for example, in Holland, that initially a lot of players were groomed and, and came through a college system. This has been, in the last few years, completely changed with MLS academies like youth development uh, setups that are now starting to show some uh, uh, results. But it's still in an in initial phase of, of obviously, uh, a, a traditional sport board like in, in other countries. I've, I've worked in Mexico where there's clubs that have been founded a hundred years ago. And here our club, which is, I think, the most historic recognized club within the United States and probably outside the United States through obviously the big names that we had on our roster, but it's still only 25 years old. So there's a lot of uh, uh, pathway to catch up uh, if you compare it to the international soccer world. I think little by little MLS is obviously taken much more seriously. That has to do with uh, the the quality of executives, the quality of decisions, and and the uh, the, the deep pockets of some of the owners that that own the team. But it's a it's a different setup, and it's a different sometimes even mindset of of uh, approaching the games. I I do appreciate that there's a little bit more long term planning here, and and not a lot of panic when there's a bad result. But on the other hand, it's also difficult if obviously within society, soccer is not the highest priority as, as for example, sports like NFL, NBA, a hockey, and to get something done here. And, and to move in a, in, a, in a direction, it's obviously takes a lot of effort and, and a lot of energy from everybody. Yeah. No, I see. It's it's indeed a, a difference whether you see it as an event or as a sport. Uh, I, can, I can see that. Maybe um, I would like to ask Gijs to join us now on screen. And uh, Gijs, you are working uh, on a very interesting European innovation project called Reimagine uh, Football, not soccer, but I guess it's the same sport we're talking about. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the project and why it's so important uh, for you? Yes, I can. Well, as I said, we, we strongly believe in innovation and development at, at uh, KNVB. So our reaction to COVID uh, was not to sit down and to, uh, and to complain. Now we put together a project team which worked hard, of course, first to make sure that we could train again and uh, to make sure that we could deal with the financial consequences of, uh, of COVID-19. But at the same time, we also joined forces with some leading uh, global football organizations like UEFA, DFL, so the organization of the Bundesliga, uh, the Johan Cruyff Arena, the City Football Group. And together with them, we started Reimagine Football Uh, com. And the goal is not to just wait for a vaccine, but to look um, uh, globally for innovations that can help us uh, mitigate the impact of COVID-19. And we think we really have to think out of the box. Uh, we have no time to lose because COVID is hitting hard also in, uh, in football. And, uh, and that's what, we, what we're trying to do. So we ask all people with innovative ideas to go to Uh, reimaginefootball.com and, and help us out on this. And uh, I think this could be a big win for football if we, if we can join forces and work together on, um, on, on a big comeback of, uh, of football with, with 100% of public in the stadium because you can do what you want. And I really have uh, great admiration for what's happening in, in Germany, what's happening in England and now in, in, uh, in USA with MLS. I think it's good that they try to finish the competitions, but in the end... We want to go back to Stadia with uh, with the people cheering and enjoying uh, around the game. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you have sort of four angles in this project. Uh, one is, for example, operational excellence, pushing the uh, sort of the capacity to the max, also maybe in this COVID times. And, uh, of course, improving mobility. Another is fan experience. Uh, this is close to event-like uh, sports. Uh, Dennis, you, you, you talked a bit about this part as well. How do you feel about this approach? And would you be willing or interested to maybe see whether you could sort of be helpful here? Does it fit into the landscape of the sports uh, sort of community in California, you think? Yeah, I, I think, um, first of all, I, I think it's a great initiative. Second of all, I think with the people involved and, and the knowledge and... and um, 
uh, individual uh, capacity of obviously the, the KNVB, City Football Group, and everybody you mentioned that there's, there is there is a, a big brain trust that that can obviously help a lot of initi initiatives uh, come to a positive end. As a little bit of a background, I think in MLS the the difficulty is is not to set up an event that what we're seeing now in Orlando. There's uh, probably no possibility of doing that in in any other country in the world because we do it at Disney. There is we're sitting at a hotel just for your idea, with over two thousand rooms. There's eighteen fields on five minute wave. There's I don't know. 12 gyms there's 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 more than enough for 26 teams to sit together they could keep us in the bubble here for, until christmas and we'd be fine there hasn't been any positive testing and uh, i'm up for a COVID test and another happy no swap for in, in half an hour so i'm looking forward to that uh, very much but uh the difficulty in the united states is that uh, and the difference with with european leagues is that uh, the 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 model here and basically the budgets based are fully on ticket sales. Um, there is not a big TV income, although in the galaxy, with our name and with our brand, we're a little bit more fortunate on that side and also on on commercial side and marketing side, but not to the extent as big European teams or big European leagues. Now this country is enormous, and obviously with growing the sport, hopefully it grows into a a, a more of a TV sport, which hopefully this event. It's like a good start, a kickoff or start to it. But you can imagine that the longer we uh, have no people at the stands or only staggered uh, audiences or however it's going to turn out, there's going to be a lot of struggle within the clubs here. There's clubs that, that draw enormous crowds um, like Seattle, like Atlanta. So in between 40 to 60 to 80,000 sometimes. Uh, at the Galaxy, we're pretty fortunate to have a great stadium, very well run, in a great atmosphere, in a great uh, part of, 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 of the city with an average, I would say, over 22, 23,000. Uh, but it makes up for a lot of our budget. So the longer we, we, um, we stay under this COVID uh, issue with not having people in the stadium or under uh, a lot of restrictions and a lot of costs also, just only the cost of testing, the cost of implementing different measures to have people into the stadium will be a very big challenge for a lot of owners, even though they have big pockets and, and everything is big and, 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 and great in the United States, as they say sometimes, but there is a limit to it. And you see it that there's a lot of teams and owners and and, and actually the, the league pushing through this event uh, with with some anxious, uh, obviously, uh, result-looking uh, ideas because there is a challenge. If if this is a going forward and this is going to take for uh, still a while or it's going to change forever, the perception of people going to events, then it's going to be very challenging in the United States as a sport like soccer um, or football, as it should have been called, but soccer. <laughs> yeah. I think um, um, it, it is challenging if we can have people to stay because based on on our budget is it's largely based on ticket sales and on and what, what they call here butts in seats. Yeah, and I, th I think that's totally the same for for the exactly. um, uh, most of the the clubs in the Netherlands and of course also for us for the national team. Uh, we we do have some good income with our commercial partnerships and of course also with uh, with the broadcasting rights. But in the end, the tickets we sell for our national team are, well, maybe one third of the income we have for an association. And you can survive that for some months and maybe for one season. But if it takes longer, then it's really going to hurt also in the, in the organization. So I fully agree with you. And, um, and it's different maybe for the Premier League or for, uh, for Bundesliga and, and Serie A and the top five competitions in Europe. But for the rest, uh, it's, it's impossible to stay on this level. If uh, if we don't have ticket sales, or we have to find other ways to um, uh, to earn money and uh, and to stay on this level. Yeah, 
I will have to round off here and thank you both so much. I think we have something in common, like a challenge you launched and presented, Gijs, for finding a better operational excellence and fan experience. Perhaps we can sort of continue to build bridges between the Netherlands and California, the LA Galaxy and the Royal Netherlands Football Association. So I think uh, this was a perfect start of perhaps a very interesting sort of uh, project for the near future. Thank you so much, Dennis. All the best for the LA Galaxy. But I know we have some other Dutch uh, trainers around, uh, Frank de Boer, Jaap Stam. So it's hard for us Dutch to really have a favorite team nowadays. But of course, we favor the LA Galaxy first and foremost. And thank you very much, uh, Gijs. And I hope you enjoy the last day of our mission. So back to you, Sietse. Thank you, Gerbert. We're a bit in overtime, so let's quickly go through the program of uh, today. So we started with Good Morning Los Angeles, um, and uh, right uh, behind us, waiting for us, um, is uh, Victoria, my colleague Victoria, for a virtual roundtable on sustainable events. Then after a shorter break than normal, we'll continue at 9.30 uh, with the fireside chat on sports and inclusion. And uh, after that, the closing session with, a sh uh, with an evaluation of the week. And those two last sessions are on Zoom. Thank you for now. Thank you for joining this uh, virtual fact-finding mission. Um, and um, uh, hope to see you again in real life here in California. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>